Good morning, and thank you for joining us for today's episode in our Facebook Live series. I'm your host, historian Edna Friedberg. 75 years ago this month, the Allied powers, Great Britain, France, the Soviet Union, and the United States, opened a series of trials, of post-war trials, aimed at achieving a measure of justice for the crimes committed in the course of the Second World War, <clears throat> excuse me, including those of the Holocaust. It was the first time in history that an international tribunal would punish the leaders of a regime, its military, and its enablers in civil society and industry. Please join me in welcoming today's very special honored guest, Benjamin Ferenz, who was a prosecutor at these landmark trials held in Nuremberg, Germany. Good morning, Ben. Good morning to you, Edna. Nice to see you, even though we are many states apart today. Well, we'll try to correct that soon. We appreciate you being with us, Ben, particularly because you are the last remaining prosecutor from Nuremberg who can speak to us about your firsthand accounts. In addition to his time uh, working in the legal field at Nuremberg, Ben has devoted his life and legal expertise to creating a more just and peaceful world. And our museum's Ferenc International Justice Initiative is also named in his honor. So Ben is a longtime friend and partner of our institution. Please send us your questions for Ben by posting them in the comments section and we will get to as many of them live as we are able. And if you experience any technical problems in the course of the show, don't worry, rest assured you can return to our Facebook page and watch the show at your convenience and we hope that you will also share it with your friends. So Ben, we are speaking to you today um, at age 101, tfu tfu, um, as an accomplished attorney who trained at Harvard Law School. But nothing in your childhood would have predicted that life or even that you would attend college at all. Could you start by telling us a little bit about your family, your roots, um, where you came from? I was born in a little village in a country that no longer exists, Transylvania. My sister was born in the same bed I was about a year and a half earlier. She was, according to her passport, a uh, Hungarian. I was born in the same bed in the same place. I was a Romanian. And uh, uh, this happened after the First World War. They were trading territories. So we were from different countries. What they had in common was they were both anti-Semitic. And uh, I was then about nine months old, but I think I told my parents, let's get out of here. <laughs> let's get out of town, go out of town. And so, so they decided they were going to leave. They left for the United States on a little boat. Uh, it was third class because there was no fourth class. And uh, we landed under the Statue of Liberty to which I felt very attached ever since. And uh, my father was trained as a shoemaker and no one told him they didn't need automated shoes in New York. Cowboys, there were no cowboys who needed boots. And he was lucky to be able to get a job as a janitor in a, an apartment house in what was called appropriately Hell's Kitchen. It was a very high crime density area. I only found that out later when I became a criminologist. And we, uh, my earliest recollections are in the cellar of a house on, I think it was 346 West 56th Street in New York in Manhattan. Uh, uh, we were very poor, but compared to where we came from, we didn't notice the difference. Um, my parents were betrothed to each other by their parents. It wasn't a very good match. So uh, they divorced. I was then about six years of age. My father had taken me to the public school in Manhattan and uh, the principal said, we can't take him, he's too small, he doesn't speak any English. And so I was late in getting started. Uh, and uh, I was taken in by an aunt while my parents were divorced. So I went, began school in Brooklyn and uh, Mostly I was moving around from place to place because the landlords would offer concession. You don't have to pay rent if you came in with depression years. And uh, so we kept moving rather than pay the rent. And, and uh, ben, ben, if I could interrupt, you eventually were able to attend college free of charge, right? 
yes, uh, my eighth grade teacher said this boy should go to college. And I didn't know anybody who'd been to college, certainly nobody in our family. And he said, if he goes to Townsend Harris High School, the only school of its kind, and he passes those grades, which are on a college level, he'll be admitted to City College. So I went to uh, uh, Townsend Harris High School and uh, nobody, my mother and I didn't know what she meant by a gifted boy. Nobody gave us any gifts, but uh, I soon found out the first thing I learned in high school calculus was that you had to study. I didn't have to study before. I heard something and I knew it. But in Townsend Harris, they were speaking French. I didn't know any French. <laughs> I didn't want to know any French. I had to study algebra. I didn't need algebra. Um, so I resisted studying some places, but the French I got over because we lived near a, a small theater which had foreign films including films of French actresses. And I fell in love with Danielle Derrier. Uh, and so I used to go to the films every night and listen. Charles Boyer was her love partner. And so I, I learned how to speak like Charles Boyer, René Vic <laughs> And uh, uh, so when I was interested, I was very good at it. But when I wasn't interested, I didn't, I didn't pay attention. Then I'm going to interrupt you, even though I could talk to you for hours and hours. I want to jump ahead to show a photograph that we have of you when you were a student at Harvard Law School. So you came from this basement apartment in Hell's Kitchen um, to, you know, the top law school in the United States. Oh, and that, that, hmm? By the way, they gave me a full scholarship. Well, I guess they knew talent and promise when they saw it. And that's where you were when America went to war in December 1941. I know from talking to you before that you tried to enlist on more than one occasion. Um, what was that like? And when you finally were admitted to the military, what were your first assignments? Well, they wouldn't take me in the Air Corps, which I wanted to get into, because they said my legs won't reach the pedals. And uh, I said, how about a navigator? And they said, well, if we told you to bomb Berlin, you'd probably end up in Tokyo. They wouldn't take me. And they were rejecting me everywhere. And I finally got in through the draft as a private in the artillery, 115th AAA gun battalion, which was supposed to shoot down high flying aircraft. And of course, I knew absolutely nothing about guns or gun battalions. And uh, my career in the army was rather, I would say, I think I was fighting the American army more than the German army. <laughs> Every dirty assignment they could give me, they say, you're a Harvard man, you can do better. Clean the toilet again and again and again. And uh, there were times when I was very tempted to use the broom in ways that they had not anticipated, but I refrained. And uh, however, I was honorably discharged as a sergeant of infantry after three years of military service. They awarded me with five battle stars. I said, what's that for? I was no hero. I was hiding under a tank or under a truck. They said, well, you landed on the beaches of Normandy, didn't you? I guess I did. And you went through the Maginot Line. Yes, I went through the Siegfried Line. You went through, you crossed the Rhine on a pontoon bridge, driving a Jeep, yes. And uh, so they said, well, all of that, uh, and you did it without getting killed or wounded. That's why we give you these battle stars. In fact, there were very few who got five battle stars. Many people survived one or two battles, but I survived every major battle of the war. And uh, I was a Jeep driver. I see a picture of my Jeep there, and I had painted on the front of it, MRI line, always alone. I said to the Colonel who, they were finally assigning me to do war crimes work. I said, just get out of my way. I'll do the job. And uh, I did, and uh, they did get out of my way and had a free hand. And uh, the reason they can do that, the reason I can do, suggest that was while I was still at Harvard, I was a poor boy, I had no money. I worked as a researcher for Professor Sheldon Gluck, who was doing a book on war crimes. And so I read everything that had ever been written on war crimes. And I was quite an expert on war crimes. So the before we get to that, Ben, I want to acknowledge uh, viewers who are watching us from all over the country, all over the world. Good morning, and thank you for joining us from Wisconsin, Indiana, Iowa, the state of North Carolina, 
hello to you in Troy, New York, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina, and a welcome to our international viewers uh, joining us from Brazil, Mexico, Sweden, Italy, and a good afternoon, Soraim Tovim, to Esther from Israel. So we have a far-flung audience, Ben. I'm very um, flattered. Mm -hmm. So as you said, um, your law training and your unusually deep knowledge of war crimes trials uh, was called upon when you were helped to establish the US Army's first war crimes branch. Could you tell us about that? And in particular, when you traveled with liberators who were collecting evidence as they entered the Nazi camps, what did you see when you were there? Well, I would say, first of all, the colonel who told me my assignment had no idea. The Army, American Army, had no idea what war crimes meant. They thought it meant on conduct on becoming a gentleman. Uh, what I saw is really indescribable. Uh, I wrote somewhere that I had peered into hell. Uh, hell was never as bad as that. Dead bodies lying on the ground. Uh, starving people scrounging in the mounds of garbage, hoping to find a piece of bread or something to meet their starvation. The people themselves look like skeletons. The crematory was still going. The bodies uh, of people waiting to be cremated were stacked like cordwood outside the, on the floor of the crematorium, outside the crematorium. And uh, the SS were fleeing from the camp. I got there as fast as I could. As soon as I knew there was a camp, I jumped into my Jeep and I took off. Uh, and, but the SS were still fighting in different places. Um, I learned a lesson in vengeance there too. One of the camps, they were all similar. Uh, the uh, inmates caught one of the guards and they beat him. And then they put him in the crematorium and warmed him up and then took him out. They beat him again and put him in again. And, and took them out until they roasted it. And uh, this taught me the effect of vengeance. When you try to let vengeance take over, you end up with roasting your adversary. And it was, it was a traumatic experience just to watch it. Uh, and of course, I've never forgotten it. And uh, so I went from camp to camp. I collected the evidence I could, which usually is, I would tell a colonel who was in charge of the tank battalion, I'd say, I'm here on orders for President of the United States and General Patton's staff. I need 10 men immediately surround the Schweibsch over the office where the records are kept. And uh, he would say, why? And I'd say, move now. You know, I, never, I had no insignia on my uniform. I refused to wear any insignia. I said, I can't do my job as a corporal or as a sergeant. Uh, and uh, so I pretended to be, I was a, <laughs> equal, equal of General Patton. And uh, they would immediately respond if I told them very definitely, move it now. Uh, and I go into the uh, tribe stool with the office, which was run by the inmates. And there I collected the very valuable evidence as to who was in the camp or what they did. Uh, they had lists of people who they had killed. They sent their reports to Berlin to Gestapo headquarters, daily reports, how many they killed in which town, who was the commanding officer there and so on. So uh, it was an enlightening experience at that stage. Uh, I moved from camp to camp as quickly as I could. They were all basically similar. I wanted to get in, get the evidence, and get the hell out of there as fast as you can. And, uh, and that's what I did in the final months of the war. And there and were to be, And to be clear, Ben, for people who are less familiar with this, you were collecting documents, documentary evidence, um, the records kept by the Germans themselves of their crimes. That was the basic thing, but there were also additional things. For example, uh, I had one case which was an Allied flyer case. Allied flyer cases were cases where the Allied flyers, the Americans and British had been flying over German held territory. And for one reason or another, the plane crashed. The aviators, the Americans, the British would get out of the plane if they were still alive. And they would be beaten uh, by a German mob, mostly women, the soldiers who were off to the wars. 
and they would beat the flyers to death. And uh, my job was to go find the body, first of all, and then to get witnesses to testify as to who had killed him. And uh, that was a grim job because uh, if there were a river nearby, I assumed the body had been thrown into the river. But very often there was nothing. There was maybe a cemetery nearby and they had dumped them into a hole. And my job was to get them out of the hole. And uh, it was winter time, the ground was hard. And uh, what I would do is locate the body and try to find the legs, put a rope around it, one or two legs if possible, put it on the back of my Jeep and slowly pull them out of the hole, hoping that I got more than a foot or a leg. Uh, That was also, also a memorable assignment. And then we would try to catch the people who had done the job. I'd go searching for them immediately if they were there and uh, or collecting evidence, give you some sense of it. The, this one particular case, I think it was in the German town of Grosgerau. Uh, they told me the people of the crowd, mostly women, were beating the soldier and uh, an airman would come down and a fireman who was on duty took a big crowbar and he smashed the American flyer to hit on the head with it. And he was sprayed with German, with American blood. And he said, that's what I like, American blood. And uh, so I asked what he, what the guy's name was. And they told me, I said, where did he live? And I got the address, I got into my Jeep. I went over there, kicked the door down. His wife was home. I said, where's so-and-so? And she said, well, he's not here. I said, side, I searched the house, nobody there. But I found his laundry uh, on the side. So I said, do you do his laundry? Yes. It was a, a shirt with American blood on it because he had said specifically, ah, I'd like to have American blood. That's what I like. So I take the, the uh, shirt and use that as evidence uh, mm. with American blood on it. And uh, uh, he was put on trial. I should mention in this context, because it's relevant, the mother of the daughter testified against her. And she said, I said, this is no way for a German girl to behave. And I tried to pull her off, but uh, I couldn't. So I interrogated the girl and she said, uh, 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 they had been in a bombing raid and had killed, they had killed my two children. And so she was so upset by that, that she said she would say with her shoe, hitting the flyer on the head with her shoe. And uh, I really, I felt sorry for her. And I said- so much, so much human misery. And I know it's very painful, uh, still emotional to talk about decades later, but um, ben, I want to get us to Nuremberg because even okay. after this work, which would have been yeah, ended up in Nuremberg on trial, she did. He did. The the man who good uh, for you. In one good of the local trials, and uh, she was pregnant at the time. So the father was the guard who got an American soldier guard who was guarding her, whether he seduced her or forced her or raped. I don't know, but uh, I happened to be in in. Uh, Munich where the trial was being held and uh, I recognized her and she recognized me and I uh, said you know what is she here for and so on and they tried her I don't know what the sentence was but it was a reflection of the human element uh, I mean I was sorry for it our two kids got killed yeah and uh, I, I just put her under house arrest I said don't go a place without my permission and then they picked her up later, did put her on trial. I don't know what the sentence was. Ben, I know that after all of this investigation, investigatory work, um, you returned home to the US to your sweetheart after the war was over and fully thought you would embark on a new chapter of your life, but you got a, a phone call that changed all that. Yes. What was that? I got a telegram from the Pentagon saying, dear sir, never called me sir before. We'd appreciate it if you'd come to Washington. We want to talk to you. Uh, so I proceeded to Washington. They are always greeted by a, a colonel by the name of Mickey Marcus. I mentioned the name because he was a Jewish boy from the Lower East Side. And uh, 
He said, Benny, we want you to go back. To go back to Germany. <laughs> I said, the only way you can get me to go back to Germany is if you have to declare war in Germany again and be losing. He said, we need you. I said, three years. You gave me every shit assignment you could. And now you tell me you need me? He said, yes. Uh, you've got the experience. You've been there. You've got the academic background. We're trying to set up new trials. Uh, this was to follow up on the International Military Tribunal case, which was already nearing completion. And he said, we don't have staff. We need you. Anyway, that was another story. I see I got you got my admittance date here somewhere when they gave me the pass. 15 May 1946. I went back into the army, <laughs> not in the army directly. I wouldn't do that. Uh, but uh, they gave me a pass to uh, the courthouse. OCC is the Office of Chief of Counsel. That was the subsequent trials which were set up, being set up then, uh, the International Military Tribunal there, uh, to try another level of German people who were involved in the crimes. Because I felt and the others felt that it wasn't just enough to take a sampling of a few high-ranking guys like Goering Germany was a civilized country. You'd want to know how they would, somebody would want to know how it was that they went and they killed so many people. So we put on a trial against the doctors who performed the medical experiments, we against the lawyers who perverted the law, against the industrialists who built the concentration camps against slave labor and who worked them to death, uh, and foreign ministers. We had 12 additional trials, and I got involved in one of those, and I hope we'll talk talk about that a little bit later. And if you're just joining us today for the show, today's guest is Ben Ferenz, and we're discussing the post-war Nuremberg trials at which he was a prosecutor. Um, and as Ben just explained, the initial trial, the most famous one is the IMT, the International Military Tribunal, the best known. Um, but the Allies established courts in each of their occupied zones to prosecute German officials after. And uh, American military tribunals presided over 12 major proceedings in which Ben was the lead prosecutor of one. So I'd like to get to that. Um, ben, you tell us about how you became the lead prosecutor at age 27, no prior courtroom experience in a trial that the Associated Press called the biggest murder trial in history. When I was invited to come to the Pentagon uh, and they were trying to persuaded me to go back into the army. I was not going to go back into the army unless we went to war and we're losing. I said, no, I'm not going back into the army. So I'll go see a man, Colonel Telford Taylor, uh, and he is recruiting people for 12 subsequent trials, which we're going to put on when the International Military Tribunal trial against Goering and company was over, and the French and the British and the Russians were partners with the Americans on that. And uh, I went, I met with Telford Taylor and he said, look, Ben, he said, we, we need you now. Uh, you've got the academic background, you've got Harvard, you know, honors and all that. And uh, he said, but I've uh, been checking on your military record and I find that you're occasionally insubordinate. I said, it's not correct, sir. I am not occasionally insubordinate, I'm usually insubordinate. I never obey an order that I know is illegal or stupid. I said, well, I've been checking up on your record too. I know you're a Harvard man too. And I don't think you'll give me that kind of orders. And he said, he smiled and he said, you go with me. And uh, so what do you want me to do? He said, well, we have these suspects in our jails already, in different categories. We don't have the evidence. You're an expert on collecting the evidence. So you go to Berlin, where these evidence are located in the various ministries. Get us the evidence for the trials. We've got the defendants, but we have a defendant with no evidence. You've got nothing. If you've got uh, the evidence and no defendant, you've got nothing. So we're going to match them. And it'll be your job to match them. So off I went to Berlin. Uh, and uh, it wasn't very long there. Before one of my researchers, I had about 50 researchers, former Germans, or many of them refugees, uh, 
He said, look what I found. And he, he bring, bring out a big batch of papers. And I, I, I can see them there. And I, you see I, I said, what's that? So I looked at it and it said on the cover, Aragnus Meldegon aus der UDSSR, I'm bragging, or my German. It means situation reports from the Eastern Front. And uh, what it was, it were daily reports sent by the commanders of special units known as Einsatzgruppen. Einsatz doesn't tell you anything or deliberately disguised, it means action groups. Their assignment was to kill without pity or remorse, every single Jewish man, woman, or child they could catch. And that's what they did. Uh, and then they made a big mistake. They made reports of it. And they sent the reports to Berlin. Berlin, they were consolidated. I was in Berlin, I had my researcher guy. The guy came in and says, look what I got. I looked at it, I know everybody who was a member of these special extermination squads, I knew when they entered which town. I knew from their report how many Jews they killed, how many others, they sometimes gypsies, they threw in the pot, and some good communist officials they threw in the pot too. Uh, and I sat at a little adding machine and I added them up. And when I reached over a hundred people murdered, according to their reports, I took a sampling, I got on the next plane, I flew down to Nuremberg. I met with Telford Taylor, who had been promoted to general. I said, General, we got to put on a new trial. He said, we can't. The Pentagon has approved it. The budget is set. The lawyers are already all assigned. And uh, we just can't put on a new trial. I said, you can't let these bas bastards get free. You just can't let them go. And uh, he said, well, can you do it in addition to your other responsibilities? And I said, sure. But he said, OK, you do it. OK. And so it came to pass. And Ben, to be clear, this murder of over 1 million innocent civilians, these were not taking place in the death camps, in the killing centers. Oh, no, this would take them wherever you caught them. You didn't have to have a special factory, like a concentration camp, or special equipment, like uh, gas vans and crematoria. They just rounded them up, shot them where they were, or usually just put them together and marched them out out of town somewhere where they had already prearranged a ditch where they knew there was a ditch and they just shoot them one at a time and dump them head first into the ditch, men, women, and children. Little children, one of my lead defendants said I was, didn't like my soldiers were taking the little by the infant and smashing their head against the tree. And I said that we don't like to do that. So let the woman hold her baby and they will aim for the child because you shoot the kid and you'll kill the mother at the same time. She'll be quiet then, you'll save ammunition. He said, I didn't like her smashing the heads against the tree, which was one of the favorite techniques. And there, these special extermination squad known as Einsatzgruppen, whatever that means, uh, they had murdered over a million people that way, including thousands of children in every town where the German army as they advanced eastward into Poland to Romania, Hungary, they, uh, that's what they did. And ben, uh, we, we have here some footage um, from your opening argument at the trial for these mass murderers. I'd like to take a look and see 27 year old you um, opening your presentation of the case. Let's have a look. I can recite it. This was the tragic fulfillment of a program of intolerance and arrogance. Vengeance is not our goal, nor do we seek merely a just retribution. We ask this court to affirm by international penal action man's right to live in peace and dignity, regardless of his race or creed. The case we present is a plea of humanity to law. Ben, we have a couple of questions from viewers. A viewer named Nicole is asking, uh, what pressure did you feel taking on the lar largest murder trial in history at the age of 27? And a middle school student named Creighton from Kewanee, Illinois asks if you were scared or intimidated 
giving your first speech in court? I remember writing the speech a couple of days before the opening trial. The day before I was sitting in the Nuremberg courtroom, it was a Sunday by myself and polishing it. Uh, the film that you saw didn't start rolling until after I had said the first sentence. The first sentence was, it is with sorrow and with hope that we hear this goes. And then I went on to say the murder of over a million people, innocent people. And the sorrow was my feeling for the victims. I had seen the victims dying, dead and dying. And hope, the hope was that we wouldn't have to do that again. That this would be, we would learn something from this trial, which would protect us in the future. That's what I meant by this opening sentence. And that's what uh, motivated me throughout the trial. First, in the selection of the defendants, I was a listed man. I knew that very often they gave him the dirty job and gave him the blame. I didn't want any enlisted men in my dock. Uh, I was limited by the ridiculous reason there were only 22 defendants in the International Military Tribunal trial. And I was told, we don't want to have more than that. So we had 24, we reduced to 22, one of them sick, died or whatever. So we had 22 defendants. And uh, I, there were 3,000 mass murderers. The members of the Einsatz group were 3,000 members divided in groups A, B, C, and D, and they all did the same thing. They murdered all the Jews, and they murdered over a million, and I had the proof. And uh, I uh, thought, well, how do I pick 22 defendants uh, out of 3,000? Every single one of them was beyond any doubt mass murderer. So I just said, well, I would pick them according to their rank and according to their education. I wanted high ranking officers. I had about six or eight generals, SS generals. And uh, I had many of the defendants had doctor titles. One of them had two doctor titles, Dr. Dr. Rush. He killed 33,771 Jews in two days. And uh, so that was the reason the way I selected them. And then the question was, what do I ask for? Uh, you ask in the criminal trial for justice, but how can you have justice and scales of justice uh, between a million people murdered and you got 22 defendants? There's no way that you can balance those scales. I did think of cutting them up to a million pieces and feed into the dogs, but uh, it really wasn't a very serious thought, but it went through my mind, how else can you balance the scale? Well, I thought if I can get a judgment which will protect everybody, that would be worthwhile. And in my case, in the Einsatz Gruber case, the victims were slaughtered because they didn't share the race, the religion, or the ideology of their Nazi executioners. And I thought that was horrible. And if we could protect them against um, that happening again, because of their color, their race, they be Jewish or not Jewish, uh, that would be enforceable and would be a step forward in the law. And that's what I tried to do. And I explained that to the court and they understood it. And uh, they gave me that in their judgment. Uh, so I was pleased uh, when I had a case could say, look, these were the guys who murdered people because of their race or their religion. They were sentenced to death and executed. That's what they deserved. Uh, so that's how it came about. And uh, did I feel nervous about it? I wasn't the least bit nervous. I was angry. Uh, I was anxious whether I could get the court to accept what I was arguing, but uh, I wasn't nervous at all because I didn't murder anybody. They were nervous. Uh, I said about my closing statement there, I said, these men, and I pointed to them, wrote the blackest page in human history. Life was their toy and death was their tool. If these men be immune, then law has lost its meaning and we must all live in fear.
So uh, uh, the parameters of what I was going to say, and I rested my case in two days, and I convicted all of them, and I didn't call a single witness. I said, I don't need any witnesses. I got the sworn documents, top secret witness testimonies, fallible testimony. I want to explain, I want to just get here. Herr Ollendorf, is your name Herr Ollendorf? Did you sign this report? General yes, yes, yes. What do you have to say? Oh, I was not there. I was all superior orders, whatever they would give me. Didn't last more than two days. They convicted all of them and 14 of them were sent to death. So uh, uh, I was not nervous at all. Was I jubilant? No, I was not. The courtroom was quiet as a mouse. After having one day sent in reading the judgment, which was a long judgment, the next day was a sentencing. The defendants were located in the prison right under the courtroom. Came up in a little lift in the courtroom, into the courtroom, the doors would open in the small entrance. The defendant would come out. Hey, Ollendorf, for the uh, crimes of which you have been convicted, this tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Take the earphones off, mount to the court, put them down, step back, boom, door would close, drop down into hell. Next one, for the crimes of you have been convicted, this tribunal sentences you death by hanging, death by hanging, death by hanging. Not a sound in the courtroom, not a sound. No cheering, no saying, hooray, or you deserve it, you dirty bastards. <laughs> Nothing of the kind, nor on my part. Um, I was got a terrible headache. Every time they said, death my hand, you could have hammered my head with a hammer. And uh, uh, the evidence of that is that it was customary at Nuremberg, the chief prosecutor would invite his staff to party at his home when the trials were over, the specific trial. The Einstein's group of trial was over, and I had to invite their staff to come to my home for a party. I went home, I said, the party is off, I'm going to bed. They had their party without me. So it was a grueling experience, would be a more accurate way. I had no sympathy for the uh, uh, mass murderers, but uh, the whole process of uh, trying to balance a million murders which is on the legs of these people it was a very serious thing. I took it very seriously and I, uh, well, I still do. It's an impossible, impossible calculus. And I wanna share with you, Ben, a couple of comments that are coming in live from viewers. Um, a woman named Adele writes, thank you from the bottom of my heart, Mr. Ferenz. As the daughter of two Holocaust survivors, and proud mom of two sons who graduated from Harvard, I feel such a connection to you and your work. You are brilliant and a true mensch. Well, thank you very much. I do appreciate such comments. Because... And another viewer named Alessandra writes on a personal note, she writes, my grandfather, Dr. Henry Kellerman, landed at the Statue of Liberty as well in 1938 and then joined you later to prosecute the Nazis at Nuremberg. Um, so there are a number of people who are connecting on a very, very personal level with your recollections. Um, I want to, to move on uh, to another thing, actually. Um, Apple didn't fall far from the tree. You are a father and your son, Don, has followed in your footsteps and become a human rights lawyer himself. And we have a clip of Don um, talking about you and about your work. I'd like to have a look at that if we could. My dad is a guy who's been traumatized by what he saw, smell, heard, and felt, you know, with his own eyes, ears, hands. I read quite a number of letters that he wrote while he was there liberating the camps, what he saw, what he felt while this was going on. This has fueled a nuclear reactor inside this man, and it's still, still, still what he does every day. Then I know we are just scratching the surface in this short program. You have devoted decades after the war, you've devoted your life's work um, to fostering an international system of justice aimed at deterring future crimes, 
promoting peace. Um, at its core, our museum is an educational institution. What do you hope that young people learn from your experience? Why do you talk? I am overwhelmed with the correspondence I get from young people in different parts of the world. And they are like the brief clip that my son referred to. Uh, they recognize that what I was trying to do was to prevent the recurrence of that type of evil behavior. And uh, I have got practically no letters ever saying, oh, you're so-and-so, you just take revenge on the Germans or something like that. None, I have no, never gotten such a letter. And I've gotten literally hundreds of letters. People say, what you're doing is right, how can we help? And uh, that encourages me to keep going, even when I'm past the hundred and one, uh, because the danger is still there. People are still going to war. People are still killing themselves. Uh, there's still racial hatreds you know, in the world. And uh, the lesson has got to be repeated and repeated and repeated. All the people would commit the crimes together and again. And they are uh, in different places, different degree, never as systematically as the Nazis, but it's still going on, killing innocent people did nothing. They are trying to come to another country, maybe to flee away from the risks of being in a war-torn country. And then for them to get to the United States, the land which gave me freedom, my Statue of Liberty, send me your homeless, you're tired. Uh, they are greeted by a president who says, no, give me the infant children. We don't let them in here. Take the child away from the mother and uh, send the woman back and we'll take care of the kid. That's outrageous. That's a crime against humanity. That's committed by the United States. And I'm ashamed of the United States doing something like that. And uh, so I have reactions uh, from the public and uh, reactions also from the government. And uh, fortunately, this administration is going to go out uh, fairly soon, I hope. Uh, and uh, they were the ones who were the president issued a presidential order several months ago trying to close down the International Criminal Court, which I worked all of my life to try to create. And uh, uh, the president said, no, if, uh, if they dare to investigate an American for anything, we will revoke the passports, we'll block the button accounts of the staff of the International Criminal Court which exists now in the Hague, uh, follow up on the Nuremberg Tribunal, which folded its tents and went away after Nuremberg. Uh, so we've been trying to build a legal order, which will deter people from committing that type of crime. And uh, we won't get much help from the uh, current administration, which I hope it's on its way out, and that they may have some more positive results from the next administration. So ben, uh, we have several. We have several more viewer questions that I'd like to pose to you. Um, and thank you for giving me um, carte blanche to interrupt you. I keep doing it. Um, a viewer named Dylan wants to ask: After living for one hundred one years, are you more encouraged or discouraged by humanity? I am neither an optimist nor a pessimist. I am a realist. The progress has been fantastic, fantastic, because we have, and I was raised the same way, uh, glorified war making. It has been a great thing. Uh, for centuries, we have praised the heroes who fought in the wars and so on. And uh, now we have a court finally uh, to pick up where Nuremberg left off and try to hold people accountable for aggression, of war, illegal war, for crimes against humanity, some of which I've already described to you, uh, and war crimes. Uh, if there is no court to try them, there is no other alternative than the combatants to start killing each other, which is what they do, and they have been doing. And uh, 
It's very dangerous today. It's more dangerous than ever. I know uh, I was confided to me 10 years ago by an American general who was active in the production of uh, cyberspace weapons. We have the capacity today from cyberspace to cut off the electrical grid on planet Earth. If we do that, I asked him, how long would it take for everybody to die? And he said, well, I don't think we have made any studies yet of that, but I would guess that it would depend upon how much water they had. If they had enough water, they probably could survive for about a week. I paused for a week. We kill everybody in a week. We can direct to the different cities. That's the future for the young generations. Wake up, wake up. You're being taken down the garden path and the path will be worse than we ever had before. So uh, I, I count on the young people to uh, recognize that what I'm saying is true. It's simply true. Law is always better than law. If anybody doubts that, then they are either stupid or, or vicious. Uh, we have to avoid war making and turn to peaceful means only to settle our disputes, no matter what they are. And even if they were a wrong decision, it would be better than going out and killing all of your neighbors who had nothing to do with whatever your complaint was. So that's the world as I see it. And I cannot help but be optimistic because we go up and we come down. We have a court, it's functioning. They have competent judges. They have a lot of tough troubles. It goes down again. We have somebody opposes it, we go up and down. But the trend has been up. But we do have an international criminal court which exists in the Hague. They represent over 130 nations have signed on to that in Rome. I was there in Rome. I made an opening speech, although I have never had any official position. I said, I have come to Rome to speak for those who cannot speak, the victims. And that's what I've been doing. I've been trying to speak for the victims who cannot speak. And uh, there's a lot of opposition to it. Then um, you speak you speak tirelessly and with clarity and conviction. We have time for two final questions. Uh, one from a viewer named William. He wants to know, have you ever had a thought about retiring or settling down? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I have thought, what would be more interesting than what I do or more important, playing golf? <laughs> it's a ridiculous thing to do. So uh, no, I think that's quite ridiculous. I'm never going to retire. I'm going to go down there fighting for what I hope to achieve. And uh, I won't achieve it in full, but we're making progress. So I'm not discouraged by the progress we've made. And as a final question, Ben, as you've described to us, you've been told no a lot in your 101 years from your first attempts to enlist to your initial plea to get prosecutors assigned to people telling you what you're doing was impossible, but the answer no has never stopped you when you believed in something. What has fueled you to keep fighting? What are words that inspire you and that could maybe inspire us? I give you three words, which will sum it up. Law, not war. If you're in a war, the way the wars are going, you're going to kill everybody. If not everybody, you'll kill almost everybody. You must build a system of law which deters people from trying to settle their disputes by forceful means only. If we don't have a court, you have no instrumentality for that. That's what this government has been trying to kill the court and those who oppose it. There are many people who do oppose it. But, and then uh, what about... And what about ordinary people who may feel discouraged, who are not lawyers, who are not in positions of power? Do you have any I, advice for them? I give them three pieces of advice. One, never give up. Two, never give up. Three. Never give up. Absolutely. You got it. You got it. Ben, I want to say, I know I speak for many, many thousands of people when I say that, uh, the combustible spark that wasn't ignited in you by the terrible things that you saw, it's contagious. Um, you really, really inspire and make us want to keep fighting the good fight. And I want to thank you very, very much for all of your work and for joining us for today's program. 
75 years after the start of the Nuremberg trials. Thank you, Ben. You're all welcome. I welcome all your help you can give me. Thank you for that. Uh, we are also very pleased, I want viewers to know, and you can look in the comments for the first time, to be able to share many, many more recordings from the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. They include, for your spare time while you're at home during the pandemic, 775 hours of audio and more than six hours of film, courtesy of the International Court of Justice. And you will find a sampling of this material in the links that we share after today's program. Ben Ferenc has helped to define international criminal law and has been and continues to be one of the most effective change makers in the pursuit of justice. Ben, we are grateful the structures that you have put in place can help contain human nature. And we will be putting more links into the comment section for people to learn about that, more about this history and also about the Holocaust Museum's Ferenc International Justice Initiative. We want to wish our, our American viewers, a very happy Thanksgiving holiday. We will be coming live back to you on Wednesday, December 16th after the holiday at our regular time, 9.30 a.m. Eastern time in the United States with a show titled Rescued Recipes about heroic actions that saved family treasures. Our guests during that program will be Holocaust survivor and museum volunteer, Stephen Fenves, accompanied by James Beard award-winning chef, Alan Shia. The two of them will share personal stories and recipes that were rescued by Stephen's family cook when he and his family were forced from their home in Yugoslavia and sent to the Auschwitz concentration camp. So until then, wherever you are, be well, be healthy, and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>